So today I'm going to talk about right. Got it. Um, cool. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about like some work that I did over the last year or so of my um, of my PhD. Uh, parts of which were joint with Sebastiano Nicolucci Golo, um, and yeah, and some of the work is still work in progress. Um, but we'll we'll yeah we'll see what's actually done and what's still worth exploring. Um, cool. And so, what are the goals for this talk? Um, and so, first, I want to describe uh, a boundary for nilpotent groups, which sees more of the nilpotent geometry than what currently exists. And so my background is in geometric group theory. And so um, there are certain uh, concepts and certain tools that are commonly used uh, that don't work as well in nilpotent groups. And so we explore a different path to see what happens. And the second goal, which is the work in progress, is to understand the long-term behavior of uh, random walks in the Heisenberg group. And, oh, and I'll say, like, if at any point you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself, interrupt me. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, no problem at all. And so we'll start with the beginning. Uh, we'll start by defining the Heisenberg group. And so we can think of the Heisenberg group if we use exponential coordinates as R3, but with a different group operation. And we can note that the group operation is just normal addition in the first two coordinates. And in the third coordinate, we have this addition, but then there's a twist. And so um, we can think about the Heisenberg group as like a twisted three-dimensional Euclidean space. Um, there's a family of dilations that we will use uh, that will denote by delta t. Um, and this is it looks a lot like a, a normal dilation in, in like Euclidean space, except in the z coordinate, we have a quadratic dilation. Um, and that is due to like the nil potency of this group. Um, we'll define the, the discrete Heisenberg group as uh, the lattice in this real Heisenberg group generated in these exponential coordinates by these. Um, these two generators. And so here we'll call this plus or minus A, and we'll call the, the Y generator plus or minus B. And something that's worth noting is that if we take a commut the commutator of A and B, um, which I'll write as A, B, A inverse, B inverse, you might wonder like, hey, if the Heisenberg group is this three-dimensional thing, uh, the discrete Heisenberg group should also be like kind of like a three-dimensional lattice, but we only have generators in the x and y direction. What's going on? Well, if you do this calculation, you'll see that um, this commutator gives you 0, 0, 1. It, and so by moving around in A and B, we can also move vertically. And so we'll call this generator C. And we see that the, the vertical generator is the commutator of the two horizontal ones. Um, and if we took other commutators, we can note that the commutator of uh, A and C, which is the same thing as the commutator of B and C, and that'll just be equal to, um, it, it, it's, it's trivial. Um, and so that's, the defining property of nilpotent groups is that if you take nested commutators, you eventually get something trivial. And that's what we see. If we did the computations out, we would find that that's the case. Uh, so this is our Heisenberg group, the real Heisenberg group, and the discrete Heisenberg group. So if we want to do some geometry, we'll want to define some metrics on these two different groups. And so for the discrete group, we'll use the, the word metric. And so we'll choose a finite generating set for the discrete Heisenberg group. Um, and we can create a Cayley graph. If you haven't seen a Cayley graph before, the, the vertices of our Cayley graph are just um, the elements of our group. And we connect two vertices if, they're, if they differ by a generator, if the elements differ by a generator. Mm -hmm. 
And what is the word metric? Like geometrically, you can think of it as the length of the shortest path between two elements in the Cayley graph. Algebraically, we can think about it as the least number of generators you need to spell your, the, the element in your group. And so this word metric gives us a well-defined um, distance on our integer Heisenberg group. And so for the, the real Heisenberg group, we'll look at subfencer Carnot Cartier Dory metrics. And so it's a lot of words, a lot of names. And so uh, let's just review what that means. And so a subfencer metric just generalizes what a Ramanian metric is. Um, and so like a Ramanian metric, we just define an inner product on the tangent space at each point. And using that inner product, we can define um, the, like, this, the speed of a, of a curve. And through the speed, we can then define the length. And so just a reminder that we define the distance to be just a length metric, where we look at all possible curves um, that connect P to Q, and we measure their lengths. And we take the infimum of those uh, lengths. And we, we can notice that in this formula, which is what we use to define the, like the Ramanian metric, all we need is the norm. We don't really need the, the inner product to, to define distance, to define length. And so we can generalize to a Finster norm where instead of putting an inner product on the tangent space, we put a norm on the tangent space. And so we lose the ability to talk about angles, but we are still able to talk about distances. In generalizing one step more, what is a sub Finsler or a sub Ramanian metric? Um, instead of defining that norm or inner product on the whole tangent space of each point, there will only define that norm or, tangent or inner product on a subspace of each tangent space. And so this picture on the right um, we, is, we can think about it as like a plane field in R3, which we can also think of as the Heisenberg group. And we notice that at the origin, um, we just have like the horizontal plane in the tangent space of, um, yeah, of, of the Heisenberg group at that point. And so if we pick out that horizontal subspace of the tangent space and use left multiplication in the Heisenberg group, we can push that uh, horizontal subspace around to any point in our group. And that gives us like a plane field or called a horizontal distribution in the Heisenberg group. And since there's a twist in the, um, in the multiplication of the Heisenberg group that we saw at the beginning, we see that these planes kind of get twisted when, they're left, when we use left multiplication. Um, and so like, what's the idea behind these subtensor metrics? Like we are only allowed to measure the lengths of curves, which um, are always tangent to these planes. And so we're restricting the directions in which admissible curves can travel in our space. Um, and in a stratified group, that is a null potent Lie group whose Lie algebra satisfies some grading criteria, criterion, any two points can be connected by an admissible curve. And so we can in fact define the metric. We can define the distance between any two points because we can always find a curve that follows uh, the, the horizontal distribution, the plane field in the right way. Cool. And so for these sub Finsler metrics um, that we're going to talk about in the Heisenberg group in our special case, they have some nice properties. They're left invariant. That's because we've just defined uh, the planes on which we're defining our norms to be the, the, um, the, the push forwards of the planes that we had at the origin. Um, one can show that they're homogeneous with respect to those dilation maps. And so our distances get scaled uh, when we dilate. And they're completely determined by the choice of a norm at the tangent space at the identity. And so remember that 
a subfinser metric space means we're just going to define a norm on a subspace of the tangent space. So at the identity, we're just looking at the horizontal subspace. And so we're just looking at a plane. And so all we need to do in the Heisenberg group is define a norm on the plane. And then we take that norm and we take that plane, we push it forward and it allows us to define a metric on the whole Heisenberg group. And so once we define our norm, like our on, on our like on the plane, it gives us a subfencer metric on the Heisenberg group. Okay, um, I guess I'll ask if there are any questions at this point. Okay, and so we have these two metrics. We have one. We have the word metric on the integer Heisenberg group, and we have these subfencer metrics on the um, on the real Heisenberg group. What's the connection? So there's a, a theorem of Pansu, and so this is work from Pansu's thesis, uh, which says that if we choose a finite generating set and define the word metric on the Heisenberg group, we can again think about it as like the the length metric on this Cayley graph. What does Pansu's theorem say? It says, okay, let's take this Cayley graph and let's scale the, the distance, scale the metric. So we can think about it as zooming out on this Cayley graph. And as we zoom out, we get a finer and a finer mesh until eventually it's going to look very close to a continuous group, a continuous group. As if we zoom out far enough, we get the mesh will get so small, it'll look continuous as opposed to discrete. And Pansu's theorem says, hey, actually, uh, in the Gromov Hausdorff topology, this metric space actually converges to the real Heisenberg group with a subfinsler metric. And Pansu's theorem is much more general than this. It applies to a, a, a wide class of groups. I wrote it down in the specific case of the Heisenberg, Heisenberg group that we're considering. And so we have this nice connection. We can think of our, our some of our subfensler metrics as the asymptotic cones of um, word metrics on the integer Heisenberg group. Okay, but how can we make use of that theorem? It's great that it exists, but like, how do we get our hands on it? Um, so given the word metric on the integer Heisenberg group, how do we know what subfensler metric on the real Heisenberg group the the, the limit the, the limit converges to. And so remember that we just need to, to, to like understand what a subfensor metric is. All we need to do is figure out what norm we put on the plane, that plane which is the horizontal subspace of the tangent space at the identity. So we just need to figure out if given a generating set, what norm in the plane do we get? And so if we have our generating set, what we can do is take that generating set and project it to the horizontal plane. Forget about the z-coordinates. You'll get uh, some set of points, some finite set of points, uh, like in the centrally symmetric set of points in the plane. And we'll take the convex hull of those points. We'll get a polygon. And that polygon is the unit ball for the Minkowski norm in the plane, which then defines our subfensor metric. So for example, let's take this standard generating set for the Heisenberg group, for the integer Heisenberg group, plus or minus A, plus or minus B. Remember, A was the generator in the X direction. So we'll get a point here. B was a generator, oh, and minus A. B was a generator in the Y direction. And then, well, that's not very symmetric, but we take the convex hull of those. And when we do, we get a diamond. Um, and so the standard generating set leads us to the L1 metric on the plane. That L1 metric will then um, extend to uh, a, like we'll define a, a subfensor metric on the three dimensional Heisenberg group. Unfortunately, um, there's work of Bruyard and then Duchin and Mooney 
that tells us a lot about these polygonal subtensor metrics on the Heisenberg group. And so we can use past work to learn about geodesics and metric spheres and other ways of understanding these subtensor metrics. And so let's take a look. Um, let's continue with the same example where we start with the standard generating set. Um, here we have what's called like a footprint. And what this picture is meant to say is like, it's, it's showing where like geodesics have different shapes. Um, what does that mean? Not super important, but it kind of looks cool. But geodesics in the uh, Heisenberg group with the subfencer metric coming from the L1 norm on the plane will fall, like the geodesics will follow these square sky spiral paths. And something that's really cool about the Heisenberg group is that the geometry is encoded by what happens uh, in with like in the shadow or in the projection to the horizontal plane. And what do I mean by that? Um, as we're following this geodesic, we might want to know, like we can see, okay, we're following a square-like path, or at least the shadow is a square-like path. What is the height of the path at any given time? Well, you can determine it by projecting your path down to the xy plane and then calculating the area your curve has enclosed so far. So the shadow of our geodesic path is going to follow this square-like path. And then we just calculate this blue area, whatever it is, that's our z-coordinate. And so a lot of the geometry can be understood just by analyzing the geometry of in the xy plane of the projections of paths. Cool. And then here are just some pictures of what the metric spheres look like. So these are the, all the points that are distance one from the origin. Um, and in the picture on the right, we can see that uh, at the north and south, south pole, we have like kind of like divots, like things cave in. And missing from this picture uh, are some vertical walls. So here in this picture, there should be four vertical walls that are excluded just so that we can see inside. And so we can see that the, the metric sphere kind of breaks up into like this, this ceiling, these ceiling panels, like at the top, we have the bottom, which we call basement panels. And then there are four vertical walls, which are missing from the picture. An observation, if we started off with a different generating set where we had the standard generating set, but we also included those vertical generators, uh, the ver generators that go in the Z direction, the asymptotic geometry wouldn't change um, because we'd still get like A and negative A, B and negative B, and then that vertical generator would just project to the origin. And so then when we took the convex hull, we'd still get the L1 diamond. And so if we look at the Cayley graph. Chris, are you ready for? Oh, if we look at the Cayley graph with this generating set, um, yeah. not much, the asymptotic geometry isn't gonna change very much. Or it's not gonna change at all. If we zoom out far enough, things will look the same as if we didn't include the vertical generators. And just a quick note on this geometry. So if we take this sphere, remember that we have the, the set of dilations. So we can scale things up and scale things down. And so for any point P in all of the Heisenberg group minus the origin, we can scale the, the unit sphere until it first touches that point. In that way, so like the point that like the sphere will, like that point will either first interact with the sphere somewhere on the ceiling, somewhere on the bottom, or maybe somewhere on one of the vertical walls. And so this allows us to partition the whole Heisenberg group minus the origin into different regions. We can partition it into vertical regions, which are like kind of the dilation cones of the ceiling and the basement panels. And then we have these horizontal regions, which are like dilation cones of the four vertical walls. Um, 
And Duchin and Mooney showed that the vertical regions account for approximately 61% of the total volume. Horizontal regions account for approximately 39% of the total volume in the Heisenberg group. So in this partition, we can see like proportionally um, how much space is occupied by vertical regions versus horizontal regions. All right. So just a couple other examples. If we choose a different generating set, we'll get a different picture. And so if we choose A minus A, B minus B, and then A, B, and minus A, B, we get this hexagon. Geodesics will follow hexagonal spiral paths. And the spheres will be like these hexagonal looking um, like cushions or whatever you want to call them. And one other example, so this I just included to try to like break symmetry. Uh, our, our, our spheres obviously are going to be essentially symmetric, but um, here this is a decagon. So this is some strange uh, generating set. And I wanted to see how weird things could get, but our geodesics are still going to follow decagons. And then our metric sphere still has some symmetry, but we can notice that the vertical walls, like some of them are larger than others. And so things are a little bit less symmetric. Um, and I think it looks cool. <laughs> All right. And so that's all I wanted to say about the Heisenberg group and these different metrics. And so now would be a good time to ask questions if you have any as we transition to the, the idea of boundaries of metric spaces. All right. And so boundaries. So in the world of geometric group theory, there is a rich theory of boundaries for metric spaces and also for groups. Um, lots of different ways of like going off to infinity um, and boundaries have been used to, um, yeah, to get a, a, a wide array of results um, from like algebraic properties of a group, like group splittings, dynamical results, geometric results. Um, yeah, boundaries can be used to understand surprising, like a surprising amount of information uh, about a space or a group. But much of the theory of um, boundaries that is commonly used in geometric group theory doesn't work as well in nilpotent groups. For example, um, one type of boundary that's commonly used in geometric group theory is the visual boundary, which is defined using equivalence classes of base pointed geodesic rays. Um, where you say that two geodesic rays are equivalent if they have finite Hausdorff distance. And so what happens if we try to study the, um, the visual boundary of the Heisenberg group? Well, in the Heisenberg group, many of our geodesics are finite first, first of all. So if you follow this geodesic and you complete it and your shadow completes the full square, you can't continue um, from this point and remain globally geodesic. You'd still be a local geodesic, but um, you're no longer a global geodesic. And so we have finite geodesics, which, uh, which can't go off to infinity. And so there are directions that can't be seen in the visual boundary because um, the geodesics end and like they can't be extended. Also, geodesics are not always unique, which can mess with the topology of um, the visual boundary. And so in, the, in yeah, I think, yeah, for, for at least the subtensor and sub Ramanian metrics that we are considering, um, the visual boundary of the, Hort, of the Heisenberg group is just a circle with the trivial topology. Um, and so we have this three-dimensional space. And then if we look off into infinity, we just get a one-dimensional circle. That's not very satisfying. Um, it feels like it's not giving us, it's not seeing enough 
of, of our space. And so an alternative is to examine the Hora function boundary. What is the Hora function boundary? Um, so we can define it by first embedding our metric space into the space of continuous real valued functions on the metric space. We do that first by fixing a base point and we'll take a point x in our matrix space and send it to the function, which evaluates the distance between that point and the input variable and subtracts away the distance between that point and some fixed base point. So what's the takeaway here? Um, we're just defining a function based solely on the metric. And for each point, we get a different, like a, yeah, different function um, in the space of continuous functions, continuous real value functions. And in this function, function space, we'll take the image, we'll take, we'll take the closure of that image under the compact open topology, and we'll define the Hora function boundary to be anything that's in the closure that wasn't already in the embedding. So any new points we gained by taking the closure. So why, why the Hora function boundary? Um, so first of all, the construction is very general. We don't really need to make assumptions about the geometry of our space. We don't need to think about like hyperbolicity, non-positive curvature, like in the no point groups and spaces of mixed curvature, we can still define the Hora function boundary. And additionally, like the top topology of it is generally like very nice. We don't need to assume very much to get a true compactification and a Hausdorff compactification of our metric space. Additionally, if you wanna study some dynamical properties of your group like, or of your metric space, Isometries of the metric space will always extend to homeomorphisms of the boundary. And so um, not only do you get a Hausdorff compactification, you can study um, the dynamics of isometries on the boundary. Downside is that the Hora function boundary isn't very rigid um, in geometric group theory. People tend to study um, like quasi -iso isometry uh, rigidity. And yeah, we'll see that the Hora function boundary isn't very rigid if we look at even uh, by Lipschitz equivalents. All right. And so, how are we going to define the boundary or like how are we going to study what the Hora function boundary is? There's a, a key observation, a key lemma. That will allow it, that will like simplify the problem. So instead of um, having to look at all sequences going off to infinity, we'll be able to uh, restrict our attention to something more like finite. And so pick a point on the unit sphere of one of the polygonal subfencer metrics. So let's fix a metric. It has some sphere. So of the three examples that I showed you, pick your favorite one um, and then pick a point on that sphere. Then let epsilon sub n be a sequence of positive numbers going to zero. We can think of those numbers as like one over the radius because we're going to take the reciprocal and then dilate that sphere um, by the reciprocal. And so as epsilon goes to zero, we're dilating by larger and larger numbers. And so q sub n is a sequence going off to infinity. And really, so you take, you can imagine it like you pick your point. On, the, on their sphere, and then you send it off to infinity along a dilation track. Um, and just a reminder that our dilation is quadratic in the z-coordinate and linear in the first two coordinates. And so we get this like parabolic curve um, or parabolic sequence of points going off to infinity. Okay, so why, 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 why are we doing this? Um, so that's one way of sending a point like the, of like examining a sequence of points going off to infinity. And so if we took that point Q sub n and use the embedding iota, it would tell us to consider this function. 
this difference of two uh, distances. And by the, you can use left invariance and homogeneity of the metric to rewrite this difference in this form. And so if we take the limit as n goes to infinity of these uh, images of points going off to infinity, we get this limit. Um, and you, if you look at this and you think about it for a little bit, you, you might think, hey, this looks a lot like a directional derivative. We're measuring the distance between the identity and some point pushed off itself. Um, like slightly by x minus the distance between the, the identity and the point we started with, and then scaling by that push factor. And so this limit gives us like a directional derivative. And so somehow there's going to be a relationship between Hora functions and directional derivatives. And that's a key lemma with Sebastiano is that for every horror function in the boundary, um, there exists some point on your unit sphere and some sequence of points converging to that point such that your horror function looks like what I'll call a generalized directional derivative. Um, generalized because now we're also letting P, um, like P sub N, move, ar move around a little bit. So it's not strictly a directional derivative but similar in flavor. And so these directional derivatives have a name at points where the metric is sphere. This derivative is called a Ponsu derivative. Um, and at non-smooth points, understanding these limits requires quite a bit of work. Um, it's not an easy task to figure out what's going on. So this observation is really just, or this lemma is really just an observation. Um, there's not much to the proof and it generalizes to all Carnot groups, which are just stratified groups with left invariant homogeneous metrics. And so while writing this down isn't so hard, using it in practice can be challenging because at, at smooth points, really not so bad at non-smooth points, there's quite a bit of analysis to be done. And um, I'll just note that you can use this lemma to like unify some results that were um, like found using a, a bunch of different methods. For example, horror function boundaries in Euclidean space and polyhedral Minkowski spaces, among others. Like other results about horror function boundaries um, could be studied using this lemma. All right. And so what we want to know is what is the horror function boundary of the Heisenberg group for our sub Finsler metrics, our sub Finsler metrics, which encode the geometry of word metrics on the integer Heisenberg group. Before we get there, though, we should um, acknowledge what was already known. So there's a result of Klein and Nikis that said that the horror function boundary of the real Heisenberg group equipped with the sub Ramanian metric, not sub Finsler, but sub Ramanian, where we just take the usual Euclidean norm on the plane and then use that to define a metric on the, on the Heisenberg group. The boundary we get is a closed, a two dimensional closed disk. And so, still, so from my point of view, We've done better than the circle that the visual boundary gave us. We have a two-dimensional disk. A two-dimensional disk is still kind of a strange boundary for a three-dimensional space, but um, we've at least, we're, we're seeing more of the different ways that you can go off to infinity is a way that you can say it. And why have I colored the, the unit sphere and the boundary in this way? So the colors give a correspondence between points on the unit sphere which you can like examine uh, the directional derivatives at and points in the boundary. And so we note that this purple North Pole, if you go off to infinity along a sequence, which like is in the direction of the North Pole, then you can converge to 
like any like any of an R two's worth of functions. Um, so there's a, a, a an open disk in the boundary um, of of Hora functions that you can converge to just by traveling um, through the North Pole in a northward northern northern direction, but like possibly um, in slightly perturbed, slightly different ways of going off to infinity in the vertical direction. Another thing is that there's a vertical collapse. And so you can't see it, but the South Pole is also colored purple. If you go straight down vertically through the South Pole, you will also converge to the same set of Hora functions. And so like the Heisenberg group for the Hora function boundary doesn't distinguish between you going off to infinity in the vertical, like straight up or straight down directions. Um, and we can see that like, if we are studying um, directional derivatives, this point in the sphere is not smooth. So directional derivatives should get messy and they, in, they, they indeed do, which is why we get a full circles or a full um, R2's worth of core functions in the boundary, just because directional derivatives and non-smooth points can look different. All right. So now what happens in the subfencer case? And so if we have a polygonal subfencer metric, um, it will have this like kind of polygonal-like metric sphere. And we might hope that something similar happens. Um, we might hope that like vertical points or that the non-smooth points blow up, that there's a vertical collapse. Um, and that is what happens, except we have a lot more non-smooth points. And so you might expect the boundary to be more complicated. Indeed it is. And so coming from the North and South Pole, like coming from like traveling off to infinity in these vertical directions, we still get an R2's worth of uh, functions in the boundary. So we get this, this disk, but there's a lot more that can go wrong. Like studying directional derivatives at non-smooth points is going to get kind of weird and it can get weird in a lot of different places and a lot of different directions. And so in this picture, we have this two-dimensional disk. And then attached to each edge of the hexagon, we have two, like, two spheres. And so these are like kind of like bananas. And so the green and the blue are actually spheres glued along um, to half hemisphere or half equators. And so we get these bananas. Uh, topologically pretty strange, um, but if we think about the boundary as directional derivatives, um, taking directional derivatives on something that's not smooth should lead us to something that's kind of strange. And in terms of rigidity, we might ask, hey, like, what if we chose a different um, subfencer sphere? But we don't even need to go to a different subfencer sphere. We can just note that um, these these subfencer metrics and the subramanian metrics are all by Lipschitz equivalent, um, and so we can already see that the Hora function boundary topologic the top topology of the Hora function boundary is not very rigid. Um, if we perturb the metric. Um, even just a little bit, we can get radically different topologies uh, in the horror function boundary. All right. And so for the last, like that was all work with Sebastiano. And then this is some work that's still in progress um, to try to understand random walks in the Heisenberg group. And so first, just some introductory stuff. What is a random walk in a group? We'll define mu to be a finitely supported probability measure on the group. We'll assume that the like the positive semigroup generated by the support of the probability measure gives us everything, i.e., like really what we're going to do is 
take a finite generating set for our group and put a uniform uh, probability uh, measure on, on that finite set. And notationally, we'll let um, the xi be independent, identically distributed, g-valued random variables governed by that distribution. So these are just representing steps in our random walk. And s of n represents the random walk after n steps. And so what we're doing is taking our, fi our finite generating set, like putting it into a bag, at each step, we randomly pull a generator out of our bag, take a step in the Cayley graph along that direction, replace the generator we pulled out, shake the bag again, and repeat the process. And so at each step, we're just going to randomly choose a generator. We'll do it with a uniform um, distribution and take a random walk in the integer Heisenberg group along the Cayley graph in this way. And so, Random walks in groups have been studied by a lot of people in a lot of different settings. And the types of results that you can get differ depending on the setting you're in. And so if you're in a hyperbolic group, negative, like with negative curvature, um, almost every, like there are results from Kaimanovich and then Meyer Tioso generalize it, but almost every sample path is tracked by a geodesic. And almost every sample path converges in the to a point in the Gromov boundary, which is uh, like the visual boundary. And so almost every sample path will send you off to infinity in a way that converges. So you're like basically going in geodesic directions. Mapping class groups, which is like generalizing a little bit, no longer hyperbolic, but not so far away. Um, there's still res there's results from Duchin and then Tiozo that Almost every sample path is tracked sublinearly by a Tegmiller geodesic. And so we don't get convergence to the boundary, to the visual boundary, but we still see that there's a, um, yeah, a general trend to follow geodesics. In non-amenable groups, there are results from Carlson and LaDrapier that almost every sample path traverses through horospheres of some horror function in the boundary. What are horror spheres? So if we have a horror function, horror function will give us um, some function on the boundary, uh, on, the, on the metric space that we're studying. Horror spheres are the level sets of that function. And so what this result says is that as we go off to infinity, um, we may not be converging to a horror function in the boundary, but we're at least going off to infinity and passing through the horospheres, um, going generally in the direction of that horror function, the boundary, but maybe not converging there. And finally, no potently groups. Um, we don't get uh, quite as like, strong results, but there is a result that's like a central limit theorem that relates the asymptotic behavior of random walks to Brownian motion. Um, Okay, and so what are we going to try to explore? Um, we're going to take we're going to take the simplest case, a simple random walk on the integer Heisenberg group. We'll take our standard generating set, we'll take mu to be the uniform probability measure on those four elements, and then um, take a simple random walk um, at every step, choosing randomly one of those four generators. So here are two, sam two sample paths um, that I plotted. And so um, these are paths, of, I think, of 100,000 steps. And we start at purple at the origin, and the colors indicate time. And so here, this is where we start in purple. We walk and we pass through blue, and then to green, then to yellow, to orange, and then red it represents like 100,000 steps. And then similarly, here we have another path that like seems to wind around itself much more. This one seems to like kind of like choose a direction and follow it for the most part. Here we get uh, some backtracking. One thing to notice is that the x and y coordinates, like the axes are on the scale of a hundred, 
while the z-coordinate is on the scale of 10,000. So even though we started off with our horizontal generators, we are traveling vertically very fast. So one type of question that we can ask about these random walks is after n steps, what is a typical sample path? Like where is the typical sample path? Like where in the space do we think it might be? And so like a similar result of a similar flavor, Mayer in 2006 showed that in the mapping class group, a sample path of n steps is asymptotically almost surely pseudo Anasov. And so this is in a different setting, but motivates the reason like why like yeah other people have asked similar questions in other spaces and other groups so in the heisenberg group what should we expect um where do we think these uh these sample paths are going to go and one way that we can like quantify this question is so if we think back and remember that we were able to take this unit sphere we have the the, the top, the bottom, and the four vertical walls, and we were able to dilate it out and dilate it in. And so we were able to partition the whole space into vertical regions coming from the top and the bottom of the sphere and horizontal region coming from the dilation cones of the four vertical walls. So we might ask, okay, after n steps, are you more likely to be in one of the vertical regions or are you more likely to be in one of the four horizontal regions? What might we expect? Well, if we the sample pass we just looked at, like we were moving vertically very quickly, and so maybe we'd expect to like always run into the vertical um, speed, like the vertical regions, since yeah, the scale of the axes was so different. And I mentioned earlier on, like oh, like Duchin and Mooney had calculated the areas. Uh, of the vertical region, like the proportion of areas between the vertical and horizontal regions, maybe we'll expect that vertical to horizontal proportion to be the same as the volume proportion, which was 61 to 39%. Or maybe we have some other hypothesis. Uh, and so this theorem, I don't wanna say too much about it, but um, it says, that it's like a central limit theorem that says that um, if we scale back the random walk after n steps, we can describe it as, uh, we, like, yeah, we can think of it as like a Brownian motion. Um, but experimentally what happens, and so we can take our random walk um, and we can project it to the horizontal plane. And if we pr project our random walk to the horizontal plane, forgetting about the z-coordinate, we have a standard random walk on the z2 lattice. And that limiting distribution is well understood. And like experimentally, we get this Gaussian distribution if we scale correctly. Um, so that's nice. But in the Heisenberg geometry, the distribution of the heights should be described by Levy's stochastic area formula, um, where X and Y are both independent one-dimensional Brownian motions in their corresponding components. And Analysts, I am not an analyst, and analysts have th that I've talked to have thought about this, and it's hard to like explicitly describe what this distribution is, um, the distribution of the z coordinates. But experimentally, what happens is um, we get this almost normal looking distribution of z coordinates, but it's not normal. It's its tails are a little bit too thin, and it's the the peak of it is a little too high. And so this is some non-normal distribution um, that we get and should be related to Levy's stochastic area formula. Okay, and so analytically, this problem of understanding where a random walk is more likely to go to a vertical versus a horizontal cone is difficult, but experimentally we can run a lot of sample paths and ask, okay, where do they end up? Do they, are they more likely to go vertically or horizontally? Um, and the split is kind of interesting because that those numbers 61 and 39 up here. And so we take random walks of different lengths 
And we ask, okay, are you, do they, how, what proportion of them end up in the vertical cones? What proportion of them land in the horizontal cones? And we get this split. And you might ask, okay, does that mean that like random walks are like uniformly distributing? Um, and like, no, that would be way too much. Um, and so is this just a coincidence? Like those numbers, like, is there any reason that the 61 and 39 really should appear, um, the, like the proportions of the volume? And so we can do some further analysis and like break up the vertical region into like regions coming from these outer panels of the vertical regions and regions coming from the inner panels of this ceiling. And so it's, it's a way of like breaking up the vertical regions into two, uh, yeah, two separate categories and the volume proportions have already been studied. Um, and we ask, okay, like experimentally, do we get the same thing? And the answer is no outer panels are um, underrepresented with respect to their volume proportion. Inner panels are overrepresented. So we definitely don't have a uniform like distribution based on volume. And that's good because that's not what we would expect. Okay. And so one other question that we could ask is instead of taking random walks of n steps, let's dilate our sphere to a large radius and then run our random walk for as many steps as it takes until we first hit that sphere and ask, hey, can we get some sort of hitting measure on the sphere, on the dilated sphere? Um, like where are points most likely to hit that sphere? And if we let R go to infinity, this problem becomes like equivalent to the Dirichlet problem for Brownian motion. Uh, and I'll just say that analysts have studied the Dirichlet problem in the Heisenberg group Analysts like things that are smooth. Our subfensor spheres are very much not smooth. So we have a problem. Um, but we can change the question and ask a simpler question and try to answer it experimentally. Oh, oops. And so our question just asks, okay, if is the sample path more likely to first collide with the ceiling or with a wall? So it's another way of asking our, our, our sequences more likely, or sample paths more likely to move vertically or horizontally. And we get a completely different breakdown that's almost 50-50. And yeah, I remember uh, my advisor, Moon Duchin was like super surprised by these numbers because there's no reason that we would expect a 50-50 split. Like none of the numbers that we know about volumes and about the, the, the Heisenberg group would expect us would allow us to expect these numbers, this breakdown. So I don't have an answer for this. And you'll note that the radius didn't get too big just because computations take a long time. Um, but yeah, so these are a couple of things that I've explored with random walks that definitely need to be thought about more. Um, and so some questions for future directions. Um, and so if we think back to the horror function boundary, like where can we extend this idea of horror functions as Ponsu derivatives? Um, all we really need to understand is the unit sphere and how the metric behaves near those near the unit sphere. So could we do this for higher Heisenberg groups or other groups, other Carnot groups? This is a question that I just like to share because I think it's super interesting. Is like this question of Anders Carlson that asks. To horror function, can for horror function boundaries in some way detect the uh, nil potent behavior? Um, and finally, this is something that I'm currently working on with some undergraduates is changing uh, the generators for a random walk and then, of course, like changing the corresponding CC spheres and ask how these random walks experiments change if we use different generating sets. Can, yeah, do we, will we still get uh, similar, like, proportions to volumes or different 50-50 splits or yeah, what'll happen if we take different generating sets. And yeah, that's all I wanted to say. So thank you.
Um, sorry, I I can't hear Shandong, but um, I have a question. Uh, okay. okay, so um, so um, so did you did you think that um, so the you know the Myers result about the the random walk and then you get a seat on us off. Um, so did you think about the, the Heisenberg group situation is the kind of analogy to that situation? How is your, like, why? I think you said vertical regions and horizontal regions. So what is the, if there's an analogy, what is it? Right, yeah. And so it's it's like a very loose analogy, but the idea is since these, like vertical and horizontal regions kind of like are encoded in the, the geometry of the Cayley graph for those finitely, finitely generated groups. Um, yeah, is there a correspondence? Like our, the question really came like from this question, like a basic question, like if you take a random walk in a Heisenberg group, what direction is the sample path most, like, most likely to travel in? Like, is it more likely to go in a vertical direction or in a horizontal direction? Um, it's a, a vague question. Um, see. Yeah. N not something like um, dynamical properties of maybe the group elements? Um, yeah. And so that's something that we like, try to think about was like, what type of types of sequences were leading in different ways? Like, are there like, um, is there something like algebraic going on um, mm -hmm. that will lead you to different directions? But uh, yeah, we didn't get very far in that exploration. <laughs> I mean, do you understand the elements with the, like, what is it like, do you have length, length functions that you can um, think about the elements in terms of? Them? Yeah, and so like we, yeah, we don't, it, it's hard to write down a length metric, like, like to write down a distance function. But there, like, we do have some programs that will compute the the distance in the Heisenberg group for any subtensor metric, and so like we, as we were running these experiments, we were also seeing like, oh, how long, how many steps is it taking? How long does the sample path of step, end, like, how far does the sample path of step end go? Um, these types of things. But so we have a lot of data, um, and yeah, that still needs analyzing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, an estimate on how fast uh, random walk leaves the origin. Is it called a drift or something like that? Sorry, say it again. Is there any estimate on how fast the random oh, walk yeah, leaves the origin? Typically, like, yeah, it'll, it'll go out with quite like uh, square root of n. Um, like a sample path of step n typically will, like, it's proportional to the square root of n, the distance from the origin. So in your study of the whole function boundary, we always two dimensional. Uh, you, oh. The whole function boundary depends on okay, the, the generating set. Yes. If you change the generating set, uh, you always get two dimensional boundary, whole function boundary. Yeah, you always you'll always get um, some like some disk, and then. Um, some spheres attached. So, so you'll always get like the, the dual polygon, like, a, like a, a disc represented as a dual polygon, and then some spheres attached to the edges of the polygon. Uh, yeah, so it'll always be a, yeah, a disc with, with uh, like the number of edges times two spheres attached. Anyone questions? Yeah, I have a question. So is there is there any hope to have um, to define a notion of boundary that's rigid under say by Lipschitz equivalences? Or is that something people even care about? Um yeah. I'm not sure. Um I think that would be tricky to do. Like it, it depends on the setting. So like yeah, there's a lot of rigidity if you're in the hyperbolic setting, um, but in this no potent setting, there's not not anything I'm aware of um, that would be rigid. 
but I'm not sure if people are trying to explore other things. Like I know that some people are studying like Z structures and Z boundaries, but I don't know too much about that and how that would look in no potent groups. Um, I, I also have two questions. Um, the, the first one is about, so you saw that if you look at like a random walk and then ask whether it ends up in the wall region or the ceiling uh, bottom region, um, that has a different distribution than if you ask, I fix a ball and then how, you know, when, where's, when's the first time I, 